Hello, my name is Shannon Stanley and I'm going to be taking you through this PowerPoint presentation on anatomy and physiology. Human anatomy is the study of the structure of the different tissues, cells and organs in the body. And the study of physiology is how all those different structures work together. So in this PowerPoint presentation, we're going to be covering off on the body regions and the different cavities cells, tissues, and organs, homeostasis, and how the body maintains balance between the internal and external environment. And then we're gonna very closely look at the different 11 body systems. The adult human body is a rather large organism. And as a result, because it's such a large organism, it needs to be divided up into different regions. This helps people, um, especially medical practitioners, to be able to locate and describe and also communicate to other practitioners where an injury may be. So we're going to have a look at the two main body regions and then we'll have a look at some of the minor ones. So one of the main body regions is called the axial region. Now this area consists of the head, the neck, the thorax, the abdomen and the pelvis. The appendicular region, appendicular being the key word meaning appendages, consists of both of the upper limbs and both of the lower limbs. Going to a smaller region, we can talk about the thoracic region, which just con um, consists of the chest, anterior and posterior, and the abdominal region, which is below the chest but above the legs. The different body regions can be further divided down into body cavities, but today we're just going to have a look at five of the major body cavities. Now, a cavity needs to be an enclosed space. So most of the major body cavities are either encased by bone or by membranes. The first major body cavity is the cranial cavity, and you can see it well indicated on the diagram on the page. The cranial cavity encases the brain and then continues down to the spinal cavity, which encases the spinal cord. The thoracic cavity encases both the lungs, the heart, and the great vessels. The thoracic cavity is divided or separated from the abdominal cavity by a large diaphragmatic sheet that separates the top and the bottom. The abdominal cavity is then encased by membranes and is protected by the pelvis and part of the thorax. The human body is highly complex and it's made of many different levels of structure. Starting off at the most basic and smallest level, our body is made up of trillions of different types of atoms. These atoms join together to form many types of molecules. These molecules also join together to form all the different types of cells that we have in our body. Our cells, when organized together, can create different types of tissues. And our tissues, when organized together, can create the different types of organs in our body. Organs join together to form organ systems. And when all these organ systems are working in completion and in harmony, they create the human being or the organism. So this is the most basic unit of life, the human cell. This is obviously a picture of a generic human cell and there are trillions of different types in our body. The human cell is made up of lots of tiny little organelles that you can see within the cell and each cell varies in what organelles it has inside of it and because of the cell's structure changes, so its function also changes. So our body is made up of trillions of different types of cells, all functioning in a particular way to create who we are. So as our cells group together um, and they start performing a specialized function, they form what's called tissues. We have many different types of tissues in the body and we're going to talk about a few here. So one of the first is the epithelial tissue. This is the kind of tissue that covers all the body surfaces on the outside, and then on the inside too, where it's called endothelial tissue. This is one of the body's first line defenses as it protects the outside and inside of the body from pathogenic agents readily moving into and out of the body. 
The next type of tissue is a muscle tissue. Muscle tissues can be broken down into different types. You get skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle tissue is the type of um, muscles that are attached onto our bones. These will aid the body in movement and they help to maintain a lot of the body's core temperature and heat production. Cardiac muscle tissue is a very specialized type of muscle tissue that is able to generate and transmit electrical impulses rapidly and is able to contract in a way that causes a pumping motion of blood throughout our body. And there is also smooth muscle. So smooth muscle is the type of muscle that lines all the different pipes within the body. So it lines the pipes of the windpipe or the bronchial tree. It lines the inside of our blood vessels and it also lines the inside of our gastrointestinal tract. So when smooth muscle contracts and relaxes, it can constrict or dilate all of these different pipes in the body, allowing for different types of movement in those places. Another type of tissue is nerve tissue. Within the body, we have trillions of different nerves, and these are important for transmitting impulses between the brain and other parts of the body. We also have our different types of connective tissue. So connective tissue includes blood, bones, and the different types of ligaments and tendons within the body. An organ is a structure made up of two or more kinds of tissues, organized to perform a more complex function than any one tissue can alone. Examples of different types of organs are seen below. So the heart is an organ, the lungs are an organ, the liver, and the stomach. An organ system is a group of organs arranged to perform a more complex function than any one organ can alone. An example of this is seen on the right hand side of the page. This is a representation of our digestive system. Our digestive system is made up of multiple different organs to perform one major function. The organs involved in the digestive system are things such as the tongue, salivary glands, the oral cavity, the esophagus, which pushes food and fluids down to the stomach, the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, and the large and small intestines, and all the accessory organs that are involved in that. The digestive system is there so that we can take in solid foods and liquids and it can be broken down into microscopic substances which can be absorbed by our system and used as fuel at a cellular level. We have 11 major organ systems that compose the human body and we'll take the time today to have a look at most of these in quite a lot of detail and then we can talk about some others later. So these are the 11 different body systems. Um, we've already discussed the digestive system and uh, now we're going to have a look at the other ones that are involved. So starting with the respiratory system, the respiratory system consists of the windpipe, the bronchioles and the lungs. And this system is what allows the entry of oxygen into the body and the expelling of carbon dioxide. The next we'll have a look at is the urinary system. So the urinary system consists of the bladder, the kidneys, and the urinary tubules. The urinary system is important for maintaining the fluid balance within the body, the pH or the levels of acidity or alkalinity in the body, and for the excretion of waste products from the body. The reproductive system consists of the sexual organs of the male and the female, and it's important for maintaining and to con continuing on the species. The integumentary system, always a tough one to remember, um, it consists of the skin, the hair, and the nails. This is a protective system in the sense that it um, allows a barrier of protection and even of immune or defense um, against all the different pathogens that are out there. Our skin has a pretty thick barrier to it. It stops every single bug or germ that we come across from entering into our body systems. Our integumentary system is also very important for protection of underlying tissues, as well as being able to feel and sense different sensations. Our skeletal system is comprised of our bones and cartilages and connective tissues. 
And our skeletal system was what provides frame and support for our body, as well as movement along with our muscular system. Our muscular system comprises of the three different types of muscles that I spoke about earlier. So that's the cardiac muscle, the smooth muscle, and the skeletal muscle. And that skeletal muscle is particularly important for generating our body's core temperature, as well as attaching on to our skeletal system in order to provide movement and function to our bodies. The next is the nervous system. So the nervous system consists of our brain, spinal cord, and all the nerves running in and out of that. The nervous system is one of the main messages systems in the body as well as the endocrine system and it's important for sending signals and information from the body to the brain and back again. The circulatory system consists of the heart, the blood vessels and the blood that's in it. The circulatory system is important for transporting blood, oxygen, nutrients, hormones and waste products around the body. The endocrine system, um, this is one of the unsung heroes of the body and uh, often people just think about the endocrine system as just being your hormones and that's what creates your emotion and your moods, um, which is only a very tiny small section of the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a very vast messenger system and a controlling system of your body. It involves a lot of very complex organs and structures as well as complex chemicals and transmitters which tell your body how to function on a daily basis. Then last but not least is our lymphatic system and this is otherwise known as our defense or our immune system. The lymphatic system is made up of lymph vessels, lymph nodes and lymph fluid as well as white blood cells that live in that system. So a homeostasis is the process in which the body maintains a stable internal environment despite the ever-changing external environment. Homeostasis helps us to regulate things like our body temperature, the fluid levels and our acidity levels. So firstly having a look about how our body maintains its temperature regulation. So the optimum body temperature ranges between 36.6 degrees and 37 degrees. So a few things can happen when the external environment changes. So firstly, we'll have a look at the images on the left hand side of your screen about how the body compensates when it's very cold outside. So here we see a gentleman skiing in the snow, um, having a wonderful time. But he has some very amazing and protective mechanisms going on inside of his body to stop him from getting hypothermia and dying. So one of the first things that happens is obviously um, our mind tells us that we need to be wearing some warmer clothes. So initially we always layer up more in colder weather than we do in warm weather. Another thing that or process that happens, which is physiological, is that when exposed to colder temperatures, our body's blood vessels that are close to the surface of the skin constrict and shrink away from the skin's surface. This moves blood away from the skin surface and keeps all that warm blood that's circulating inside of our body in the core area to keep all our vital organs nice and warm. And this helps us to stop losing so much heat at the skin surface. Another physiological response that happens is that when you do get cold is that your body starts to shiver. And as I've mentioned already before is that your skeletal muscle, when it starts to move and engage, it generates heat, temp um, heat energy. And this actually is what creates your body's core temperature and can raise your temperature too. So when your body starts to shiver, it's not a bad sign. It's a good sign. It's basically trying to generate some more heat energy in order to increase its core temperature. Another physiological thing that happens when it's cold is that you actually get goosebumps on your skin. And what this is, it's that it's all the hairs on your skin standing to attention um, and standing nice and straight. And when that happens, the hairs on the surface of your skin and around your body try to trap or insulate a layer of heat around your body so that you're less likely to lose heat as quickly as you would normally. Now we'll have a look at the opposite. So when it's warm or when it's hot, your body has different physiological responses to 
how when it's cold. So on the right hand side of the page we have a gentleman running through the forest. It looks like a nice warm summer's day. He's wearing shorts and a t-shirt so he's not laid up like the other gentleman in the snow. And when you're doing exercise your body is generating lots of heat energy like we mentioned before because all that skeletal muscle contraction is taking place. So your body is generating more heat. He's running outside, might be a hot day too. And now how your body combats the temperatures going too high internally is that it starts to release as much heat from the body as it can. One of the mechanisms your body tries to release lots amount of heat is by dilating all the blood vessels on the skin. You might notice that on a hot day you would look down to your hands or your arms and you would notice that all your blood vessels on your hands are sticking out so they're very distended. This is your body trying to get as much of the nice warm circulating blood to the surface of your skin where heat can evaporate through your skin surface and out into the environment. This is one of the methods to try and cool you down. Another method to try and cool you down is the body's capability of releasing sweat. Now when the body gets too hot your body starts to sweat and this releases fluid from your body. Now this fluid is easily evaporated in the heat around it and that also helps to cool the skin's surface down and all the blood coming up to the surface as well. You might also notice that when it's very hot outside that you become very lethargic and you don't feel like exercising as strongly as you would or you don't feel as energetic as you would um, compared to when it's cooler temperatures. And this is another mechanism that your body tries to use to slow you down in hot weather so that you don't produce as much heat energy as you normally would. So on this slide we're going to be having a look at fluid regulation and how your body uses homeostasis to regulate the fluid in your body. So have a look at the picture on the right hand side and look at all the very important things that water is involved in in all the processes inside the body. So water helps our body to digest appropriately. It helps us to produce saliva. It helps us to break down our food into fluid medium that we can absorb it in easily. Water bathes and surrounds our cells. It also lives inside of our cells. It helps it to go through all its normal functions. Water lubricates all the joints in our body and is one of the biggest components of our blood that transport our blood cells around our body too. It helps to regulate our body temperature. It helps to produce hormones and neurotransmitters that our body uses to send signals and messages around. It also acts as a protection and a shock absorber to all of our organs as they're surrounded by double membranes and fluid within those membranes to help keep it protected from small knocks and bumps. But we'll move on from all the different functions of water and talk more importantly about how your body actually regulates this. So the adult body is made up of approximately 70% of water. We gain our fluids or our water by ingestion. And we all know we're supposed to drink a certain amount of fluid or water every day and most of us just don't reach that um, required <laughs> amount. And our body removes extra water through things like urination, where most of our toxins are released from our body, through the process of sweating and our thermoregulation, and through our normal respiration. So every time we breathe in and out, we're actually eliminating particles of water through our breathing. So we lose quite a lot of water every day, and that's why we have a recommendation of drinking a certain amount each day. The current recommendation of how many glasses of water we should be having is eight glasses, which I think equates to about two liters of water each day. And that's to ensure that all of these important processes in our body are taking place and that we're functioning in a healthy way. Another very important homeostatic balance within the body is the regulation of our blood pressure. Now blood pressure is primarily regulated through our blood vessels and it's very important that we maintain a good blood pressure. The reason behind this is that we need to maintain a certain amount of pressure within our blood vessels in order for the red blood cells, oxygen and nutrients to keep moving through our entire system. So it's a pretty important thing to maintain. If our blood pressure can drop too low, 
This may result in somebody fainting because they don't get enough oxygen and blood up to their brain and their vital organs. If the blood pressure is too high, it can cause damage to blood vessel walls and cause things like heart attacks and strokes. So it's very important to regulate the blood pressure effectively. Like I mentioned, one of the primary ways of regulating blood pressure is through our blood vessels. So I've mentioned already that when you're hot, the blood vessels on your skin dilate and they get very, very large. And this is to allow lots of blood flow to that area to ensure that heat evaporates through our skin and off our body. The same kind of thing happens with regulation of our blood pressure. So blood vessels, they contain smooth muscle, have the ability to constrict and dilate. So on the one diagram, we see vasoconstriction, and that's when the blood, the blood vessel has been made very, very small or constricted. Now, if a blood vessel goes very small or constricted, if the same volume is in there as before, the pressure would increase because the size or the um, of the container has decreased. The same kind of thing happens as when your blood vessel dilates. In dilation, the blood vessel is expanded and is made larger. And if the same amount of volume of fluid was in there as it was in the constricted vessel, this would result in a drop of blood pressure. So vasoconstriction causes an increase in blood pressure and vasodilation causes a decrease in the pressure inside the blood vessels. So one of the other methods that your body uses to regulate its fluid balance is by the intake and elimination of fluid. So we take in water um, through our ingestion and we eliminate fluids through sweating, through respiration and through urination. Another element that helps to maintain or regulate blood pressure is the amount of salts, minerals and electrolytes that, that are in our blood or in our tissues. So it's very important that we don't overeat or over ingest salt products because it actually results in an increase in blood pressure. All right, so before we dive into how your body regulates its pH, I just want to show you where the body actually gets its acidity levels from. And that's actually from the process called cellular respiration or metabolism, which takes place inside the cell. So just starting off from the beginning, um, our cells require two things in order to survive at a very basic level. They need oxygen and glucose. So in order for oxygen to get into the cell, it can just move past the membrane nice and easily. It's allowed full access, but glucose is a bit of a tricky molecule. Glucose has a difficult time getting into and out of cells. So it needs its friend insulin to be able to open the door of the cell to allow it in to be used by all the organelles within the cell. So once oxygen and glucose have entered into the cell, they undergo a process of cellular respiration or metabolism where they're broken down to create energy that is used for many different cellular functions. One of the byproducts of cellular respiration is heat energy. And I've mentioned this already about when skeletal muscle moves and contracts, it creates heat energy. So any cell that undergoes cellular respiration can create heat energy. It's just that skeletal muscles undergo cellular respiration at a rapid rate when we're moving, particularly exercising, and this creates lots of heat energy. Now the waste products of cellular respiration are carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions. Now carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions, when they're accumulated in a space have the capacity to make things very acidic. So when our body undergoes normal cellular respiration, we have all this acid production as a result of what's going on inside every single cell in our body. So our body needs to get rid of all this acidity because if the body becomes too acidic, many very vital chemical reactions will not take place anymore. So in the next slide, we're going to have a look at how this actually happens. 
Okay, so how your body actually maintains this pH or this acidity um, that is produced from your cells is through a slightly complex equation um, that I'm going to show you now. So before we get tucked into that, I just want to draw your attention to the image that's just popped up on the screen now. Um, so what's come up here is the pH scale. So the pH scale, if you've never seen this before or been exposed to it, this is a scale or a ruler or a measurement, whichever way you would like to think about it, of how acidic or how alkaline something is. So the body has a normal pH range, just like it has a normal temperature range or blood pressure range or heart rate range. It has a normal pH range in which it can function in and work very well. And the normal pH for any human body is between 7.35 and 7.45. Anything that goes above that pH is something that becomes alkaline. Anything that goes below that pH is when the body becomes um, acidic. And again, if the body becomes too acidic and also if the body becomes too alkaline, the body, the body cannot undergo its normal chemical reactions that it needs to in order to survive. And one of the most basic ones of this is its ability to pick up oxygen from the lungs and drop off oxygen at the tissues. Now, without the body being able to pick up and drop off oxygen where it's needed, we would ultimately die. So it's a very important thing for the body to be able to maintain. And this is how the body is actually able and capable to do this. So these hydrogen ions that are released by our cells enter into the bloodstream where it can combine with these bicarbonate ions. So these bicarbonate ions are just naturally floating around in our bloodstream all the time, getting ready to pick up hydrogen ions coming from the cells. When these two combine, they become what's called carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid can quite happily travel through the bloodstream up to the lungs where it's going to change and dissociate into water and carbon dioxide. Our lungs breathe out carbon dioxide and this is how we rid our body of that excess CO2 and the hydrogen ions. It's so important that your body maintains all these different processes of pH balance, of maintaining its body temperature, of maintaining fluid balance and blood pressure inside, just to keep the whole system working together effectively despite all the changes that occur externally and internally, homeostasis works together to make sure that there's a constant and a regular internal environment for your body to undergo all its necessary processes to keep you alive. So that concludes our introduction to anatomy and physiology and the videos following this will be looking at the different body systems in much greater detail. So thank you for joining me today and we we'll look forward to seeing you again.